Amy, Wayne, Daniel. I'm gonna let a few more people join here. Mark, I owe you a call. Ted, what's up? Good to see everybody. Invite your friends, hit the share button. I want to tell you about a, uh, my, my title here is, um, how does music evoke emotion? And I started thinking about this yesterday. So I was, I was driving home. I went to pick my kids up from school and, um, I had made a new video on uh, my YouTube channel. And for those of you that I'll do my shameless plug that haven't joined my YouTube channel, find it it's under rick beato i don't know what it is but you can find it you, you can find it just type in google rick beato youtube you'll find it anyway so i've been doing this series of i've made 90 videos now i think um over the past five months and i hit twenty one thousand subscribers today which is really really hard to believe since it's hard you get them one at a time on youtube um you gotta you gotta work for it as, as some of you know that are YouTubers. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm doing this series of different for, it's kind of like a film scoring series and it's on different scales and different modes. And um, so I was doing this one on the Phrygian mode. So a lot of times I'll write little pieces, you know, one minute things or something and I'll play them and just like I'm doing here with you guys right now in the intro, I'm playing music and I'm just sitting here waiting that, you know, the Facebook Live builds an audience. So the kids are riding home from me and I have this little stand that I put my phone in in case I want to use my GPS or whatever. I was like, hey, I made a new video. I want you to check it out because I put Layla in it and I have this, my, my three-year-old. So it was a thing where I'm playing this minute-long piece based in the Phrygian mode. And uh, Phrygian mode is the third mode of the major scale. So... It sounds like a really dark piece to me. The, the Phrygian mode is this scale, so it goes like this. It's beautiful, dark. I think that's really dark, moody, mysterious. I don't know if I'd call it scary, but so. Anyway, so I'm playing this video in the. Uh, or I'm playing this music that I wrote in the video, and normally I just sit there and I look kind of dumb just sitting there listening to this music. And uh, uh, so I decided to put a little video over it. So I took this slow motion video I had taken of Layla on the swings, and I kind of did the opacity where you can see through. You can kind of see me a little bit. I made it blue because it's a very blue sounding, very dark sounding mode. And I even darkened my video so that it would kind of make make the mood of, of what I think that sounds like. And really that mood of that scale is really because of the that half step in the beginning of the scale really gives it that 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 dark feel. So I play it for the kids and I'm showing them they can see Layla in their swinging in a slow motion and and they said, they said, oh, that that's really sad. That's really sad. Oh, that's happy right there. And I was like, what do you mean it's happy? Oh, when it's when it plays fast, it's happy. Fast is happy. And I said, what are you talking about fast is happy? Why is fast happy? Well, it is. Oh, and you played up high there. High is happy, too. So it, I don't think you're really... I don't think it's really sad, Dad. Um, I think that there's some happy spots in there. <laughs> Yet the whole bass part is this ost ostinato. Ostinato means just a repeated pattern. So that's the, that's the left hand pattern, and and I just think oh it's so dark and 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 but kids' perception because they don't have any their only perception of what something sounds like is really based on the TV shows and the movies that they watch. And then I started thinking about it. Well, that pretty much that's pretty much what informs everybody about what gives music its mood. And how, how it affects you personally. It's like your experiences, either what a song means to you based on what happened in your life when you, uh, when you heard it, if there was some traumatic event or something that's associated with it, or 
you know, if you're watching, I did a video on Bernard Herrmann, who's an old school film composer. He did all the Alfred Hitchcock movies. So there's this uh, uh, cue to the murder scene, the shower scene, um, where um, Norman Bates comes in and there's, you know, the slasher thing. And it's like, wah, 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 and it does these really dissonant clusters. And it's, and, and then I played that for the kids. I just played the music for them after. And they say, well, that's scary. So they've never seen Psycho, but obviously they won't see Psycho until they're adults probably. But to them, that music inherently sounded scary. The, um, because of the dissonances in it, because there's a lot of clusters, a lot of half steps. And when I say that, it's got, you know, and then it does these, then it has these. And it's really, really intense, all these clusters there. So that is what's, what's uh, you know, kind of, there. it's shocking sounding. And and when you think of it, the bow, the bowings are like, whoop, whoop, whoop. And it's just like stabbing. It's like the stabbing thing in it goes right along with the music and these real dissonances. Yet they've never seen it. But to them, that music, because of those half steps, sounded scary. Um, so there is something to this that independent of the music, even without seeing this, that you are informed by, um, by the music you're listening to. I had a song that I produced years and years ago with this band Jump Little Children, and it's called Midnight. And the story uh, of the song, and already kind of, kind of makes me it makes me really sad when I listen to it because the two bro there are two brothers that were in the band. They've now dis dis uh, have disbanded, but it's a it's a great record. It's called Between the Dim and the Dark. It's on it's on iTunes, and and it's one of my favorite records I've ever done. But so there's a song called Midnight, and the two brothers in the band had just lost their father six months before uh, we did the record, and the song is about their dad and about losing their dad uh and it's a really kind of heart-wrenching song and the day i was mixing the song i was alone in the studio and my sister called me and she was crying and uh, my oldest sister pat and she said that and my dad had not been feeling well for a long time and she said that dad is really really sick um he just got diagnosed with lung cancer and I said, how bad is it? And she said, oh, it's stage four. And they said, you know, three months at the most. And um, and I was mixing this song. And I immediately set up a flight to fly home the next morning. And I finished mixing this song, knowing this thing. It was my dad's birthday two days later. He was turning 85. And... Um, and the song has so much meaning to me because it was about their dad that had died of lung cancer, or of di I think it was lung cancer. Their dad had, di had died, and the song is really, really, it's absolutely beautiful. It's called Midnight, and and uh, and I I relate this news of hearing my dad was incredibly sick with cancer, and my dad ended up dying three weeks later. I mean, it was really advanced. And um, he went from not being able to, he went from driving one day to the next day he couldn't walk upstairs to the next, to three weeks later he died. And I was home for those three weeks and it was, uh, it was heartbreaking. But that song has this meaning to me because of what, and all of you have had, had these things that, that um, music that, that, uh, that has an that you have an emotional attachment to based on what was happening in your life when you were hearing it but i think also inherent in certain types of of music and things that you play have moods because simple interval intervals have moods which is why when the kids are hearing that chord from psycho they just inherently think it's scary because of the all the the, the because it's got these four chromatic notes all spread out over an octave. And I think when I hear this um, this Phrygian thing that I did as an example for my video, it sounds sad to me and probably to my kids a few years from now after they have more experiences and they're more informed and they draw more associations with music through watching movies, through listening to things where they start to develop their favorite songs and things like that, that they will 
develop associations that go with chord progressions, that go with melodies, that go with dissonances and melodies, or, you know, um, I, then I, I started playing them stuff as we were driving on the way home. I started playing them things like I played them some of the Shawshank Redemption soundtrack, which they had already known. They'd listened to it many times. Oh, that's very sad there. They, there's a, a, a cue called uh, Compass and Guns, or Brooks was here, and it's a really, really sad, um, sad piece. So, um, and there's a reason that people use certain modes, like Lydian is a more of a kind of a triumphant uh, has this triumphant kind of uh, sound that you hear in movies so like Lydian would be like You hear Lydian in soundtracks all the time. If you hear, um, uh, if you ever saw that movie uh, or that uh, Six Feet Under, that old HBO show, it starts with this chord, this Lydian chord, E flat, Lydian chord. Right there evokes a certain emotion. Just one chord like that. Um, it almost has a a other a um, uh, a suspension suspension feeling or something like that. I don't mean suspended chord. Or when you hear the whole tone scale. It sounds like a dream. That's why film composers have used... Anytime you see in old TV shows and things, you see dream sequences, you hear the whole tone scale because that because there's no half steps in the scale. It gives a dream-like uh, vibe to the listener. So, um, uh, mu what is this, Cindy? Music is a powerful tool. It can change your mood. Oh, I mean, you can do everything. I mean, if you take, and, and, and I use this in, as an example, every 10 years, Charlie Rose does a show with, uh, with Tim Robbins and Morgan Freeman about the Shawshank Redemption and Frank, uh, Dar uh, Dar Dar Darabond, Darabond, is that his name? Darabond, the director. And they talk about the movie. They've done it at 10 years and at 20 years. And it's such a classic movie. But they don't have Thomas Newman in the... They should be interviewing him. Take away the music to that movie, which is a phenomenal movie. And it's nothing. That music is so powerful. I, I always like, like to use it as a, as a demonstration. Especially the, uh, the, the, the one scene from... Uh, from the, you know, the, when he's breaking out of the prison, uh, so that, those chords are the D flat major to this E six, nine to D sus four, to B sus two, D flat major, E six nine to D Lydian is the it's the scene where he's coming through the sewer pipe to escape. That is so powerful that that just the way that those uh, progressions work. This major chord by itself, you hear it and you're saying, okay, well that's a cool, uh, you know that that's that chord ha has a kind of a vibe within itself right there because it's in the key of D flat. If you don't have perfect pitch, which I don't, but D flat has a sound to it. But the second chord then has a certain vibe. But once you hit the third chord, that's a D suspended four chord. That chord gives the mood to that section. Listen. So, um, the dissonance in the third chord, this chord here, this this D sus four. It's a, if it were this, it would be D major. So that D suspended four, that 
bring that uh, gives it an angst that interval combination of there of that suspended fourth if you hear it in the progression that's okay okay and then and when it drops back to there and then uh, resolves down so that has a certain vibe just like the that's what it is, but it actually has an F in there too. So that, all those kind of, you, you get these. I can't grab all those notes in the in the orchestra there. So I can grab that and then, there we go. Doesn't quite have the right attack, but that chord though is frightening sounding when you hear it. That cluster makes you, whoa, what is that? And especially since they have that slashing motion in the bowing, it's a marcato bowing, which has a little triangle on the top. It's called a marked bow. So it's really aggressively played. So that, um, that kind of informs you that those intervals put together, regardless of whether you've seen the movie or not, or have an association with it, because my kids have never seen it, but when they hear that, they're like, oh, instantly within three notes, oh, that's scary. So they know that just from those intervals, because intervals have emotions to them, just two notes. If I play this interval, that sounds kind of, that's a major third, but up a 10th. But if I play this interval, That has a completely different vibe. That's a sharp four. If I play this interval, that's a flat nine. That so, um, I'm just playing two notes here. If I play, I'm playing F in the bass and I'm playing B up here in an octave. But if I play this, a simple major third, just two notes, a ninth, that's nice. Sus four wants to resolve the air, but the Lydian, wants to go up and they and I'm only playing two notes there just in octaves but they those intervals do inform you when you start adding notes to them you start to get even more information uh, emotional information I'm gonna play you this Phrygian thing that I played for my kids and it's it's just a piano and strings thing but just so you can kind of hear what the vibe is part they said oh that's sad now 
I just saw an interesting comment here. I think emotions we associate with different types of harmony are largely culturally relative. I agree with that to a certain degree. Um, when you buy a wind chime, it's usually a pentatonic scale, okay? Now, a pentatonic scale is... That's a pentatonic scale. It's very... And they use that in Asian music a lot, okay? You'll... Now, the one thing about the pentatonic scale is that it has no half steps in it. And with no half steps, there is no dissonance. And with no dissonance, there is no, to me, there is no mood, there's no angst, nothing. You need to have those half steps in order to have tension because that they're actually called tensions. And the reason that there's tension is because when you play two notes together that are half step apart, there's a super fast beating that happens. I talk about this in some of my interval lectures, and I talk about it in my new ear training series that I've got coming out, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll plug this right now. I have a very involved ear training series that's, that's going to be probably 12 to 15 videos that I'm going to have out in the next few weeks that I've been working on. It's, it's pretty ambitious. Um, but anyways, I talk about the... Hearing the beating between certain intervals, and when I play a half step, there's a lot of beating. When I play a whole step, it's a slower beating. When I play a minor third, it's fairly stable. Major third has a little different sound to it. Perfect fourth, as you get into the perfect intervals, there's much more stability. So your perfect fourth, perfect fifth, and octave have more stability to them. Perfect fourth, Perfect fourth can can be unstable also because it can want to resolve down to the third depending on if there's a, a context to it. But there is a cultural element that uh, that is associated with it. There there, there are indigenous music to, to certain cultures. Uh, my friend Aydin, who is what I was playing here when I started, he's from Turkey and they have their traditional Turkish music, which has a lot of odd time signatures and... Um, and we'll have microtones and things like that. A microtone is in between half steps, a lot of just slightly bent notes. Um, but they also have a lot of Western music. Most people listen to Western, you know, popular music and Western classical music. And he, tr he was trained in Western classical music, you know, and, and in jazz. And there's a huge jazz scene there. And there's a lot of really well, hugely accomplished Turkish musicians that are, you know, that play Western music, whether it's Western classical or it's Western jazz music. Um, and uh, their popular, their folk music is very different. So just like when I go to a Mexican restaurant and I hear, you know, music that's like mariachi music or whatever, that, that'll have a lot of horns and it's real happy sounding and everything. And, and uh, yet I have plenty of people that are on, I'm sure I have people on here from Mexico watching this right now that are, into really serious classical music and jazz. And when I mean serious, I mean, you know, modern. When I, I don't mean serious, that the other music isn't serious. But there's a cultural aspect. Uh, I think that people, um, there is there is intensity, there's inherent emotion to things, regardless of whether you have experiences associated with them. The experiences make them stronger, though. There's no question about that, that experience... When you have a, a an emotion attached to a song, it makes it more powerful. Absolutely no question about that. That is the power of music. And when you put lyrics to music, and there's a lyrical component in addition to it, that's, to me, some of the most powerful. There's a Bach cantata, number 54. I always talk about it. It's one of my favorite pieces of all time. There's a version of it on YouTube. If you look up Glenn Gould, uh, G-L-E-N-N-G-O-U-L-D, and... Uh, on Bach, and there's about 10 minutes into this long recitative that he does talking about Bach, this this recitation about Bach, really fascinating. Uh, he has this countertenor named Russell Oberlin, who just died recently, that sings this beautiful Bach cantata number 54. It's one of the most gorgeous pieces that I've ever heard, and it's very, very brooding and dark. And it starts with this chord, and, and he talks about it, that it's... 
He plays that. That's the first chord in the piece. And this is in, you know, 1720 or so. That's what the orchestra played. It's it's a B7 uh, suspended four with the third in with the seventh in the bass. And it's pretty much as advanced of a of a chord as you would hear until 200 years later or so. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, when I listen to things off the Rubber Soul and Revolver, especially Revolver record, John Lennon puts together lyrics and melodies like in I Feel Fine or Rain, which was a B-side, or... Um, or Tomorrow Never Knows. There's this really ambiguous harmony, a lot of suspended notes, a lot of dissonances, or Norwegian Wood. Uh, a lot of dissonances in the music, and um, that Norwegian Wood is in, in E Mixolydian, and, and uh, it has a very hypnotic sense to it. And the, the lyrics of these songs, like when I hear Tomorrow Never Knows, or Rain, that's, that's a really great, great, great one. Or She Said, She Said, there we go. That's a perfect, perfect one that combines this moodiness to it and these really psychedelic lyrics that, that have so much imagery to them that it just takes you to another place. And that's the thing about instrumental music can inform you to a certain degree, and then when you put the visual to it in a movie, you get that feedback loop of what, you know, the emotion. If you have a big brass section playing and you're listening to... To Star Wars, and you have this incredible scene with this giant orchestration of an expanded orchestra. It's exciting, you know, and you hear this kind of anthemic, you know, music that has all these uh, nationalistic kind of overtones to it. It gives you a certain feeling, you know, exciting, uplifting feeling. Or you hear the Shawshank Redemption, and you hear a more, um, that's right. Oh, do say. That's it. I don't know if you guys know that one. So it start, starts here, it goes like. know that piece it's really beautiful it's all through the Shawshank Redemption it, it they it, they do different versions of it uh, that, I think that that's the one that's Brooks was here or compass and guns and it's orchestrated different in different parts it's incredibly sad and and the uh, the spread the spread triads it starts with a just a root fifth root chord whoops I'm sorry I'm kicking my stand here I'm trying to get my pedal but it starts just with a root, fifth root. And I have a whole video on this where I talk about the Shawshank Redemption. It's called Spread Triads on my YouTube channel. And I use this ex this piece. And then it goes to a C major spread triad, meaning I take a major triad, I take the middle note, and you move it up or down the octave. And then it goes to B minor. And then it goes to A major to C sus2. And then it goes to F major in first inversion then to A5, and then they go in, rel in contrary motion, A, G major, F5, G major, then down to D major, which is a spread triad. And it's absolutely beautiful and very melancholy. And, um, you know, but the, I do have those images that I associate with the movie that has these really moving things. So you can't really, uh, once you've seen it, you can't, you can't separate the two things once you know the movie. Same thing with lyrics. You can't separate the lyrics. When I hear Angie by the Rolling Stones, that's like my favorite ballad of all time. And I just have a certain feeling. Every time I hear it, it brings me back to the same place when I heard it 50 years ago. Um, all right, let me see what some of you people are talking about here. By the way, if you want to see some of these YouTube videos, you guys, whoever hasn't signed up for my YouTube channel, you should you should subscribe to it because it's really there's some I, I I feel like I've done some of my most inspired work other than uh, with my children 
um, on there, and uh, it's it's a way to uh, for me to um, to give away my ideas and um, my my the things that I've learned to people that haven't been as fortunate as I have in having the incredibly rich musical upbringing that I had through my family and through my education and from being 54 years old as well. Um, let's see here. Somebody says here, who's Gussie? says, really don't know how on earth I do it. I don't know how I do what, actually. I'm not sure. Uh, Sweden here, cheers. If you guys want to ask me questions, now's the time. Start typing them in. Tell me where you're from. Tell me what you want to know. If you guys are my YouTube subscribers, tell me that. I'm really curious to see who, who on here is, is a YouTube subscriber and has seen any of my 90 videos. I think it's 90. I think I hit 90. I put out one in the last three days, each of the last three days, but um, I just do it in my spare time, which I have very little of after the kids go to bed. My major and minor is a natural occurrence in the way we communicate. Martin, that is so true. You can hear psycho stabs and Jamie's got a, Jamie's got a gun. Does Aerosmith do that? Psycho stabs? I did not know that. Um, can anyone name the repeat the name of the record? Between the dim and the dark. Um, between the dim and the dark. Yes, that's need. Uh, Jump little children is the band. Hello from Jordan. I'm Ed. Can I give some interval moods? I think I I think I did that actually. Darabont, that's that's Frank's name. I, I couldn't I don't know why that thank you, Evan, for that. Emotion is energy in motion. I like that. Music is the most powerful form of, of entertainment. Frequency is what we have let's see here. American Beauty without Newman is half the masterpiece. I totally agree. I don't know how. You know <laughs> this is really interesting. So Every time, I don't know if you guys have seen this Hans Zimmer commercial for his music uh, film scoring, and uh, and I always walk away from his movies now where I don't ever remember anything from them except for a couple of chords. That's the thing now, I guess, in movies is that you're not supposed to have any themes that you can remember. Love to see a video on dissonance. That one is always such a big issue. Uh, that's a great idea. I'll do a video on dissonance. Do I think the reason sounds we associate with happiness... In addition, because they actually affect us in a positive, negative way. Well, you know the, the the you know it's interesting when you talk about major. I think that one of the uh, things that you can't divorce from major tonalities is that the earliest chord that we get in the overtone series is the major chord, the major triad. If you strike a guitar string and you play at the twelfth fret, you get the octave. You play at the seventh fret, you get the oct. You get the fifth, and then. You know, between the what it was it what is it the fifth, fourth, and third fret, you get a major triad. You get you get an E major triad. So right there in the overtone series uh, is a major triad. It's part of the it's part of the fabric of the universe, or at least the way that molecules react uh, with harmonics when you strike a string or blow through a a tube or, uh, you know, whatever, however you produce a sound, there are harmonics associated with it in the harmonic series, at least in our gas, uh, in our atmosphere, uh, produces these certain pitches. And a major triad is the first structure that you actually get to, other than an octave and a fifth. I agree with your kids. It feels like memories of a better time while in a bad situation, just my opinion. That's great. Uh, when my daughter Layla, when I showed her the video, and it's her on a swing, if you go watch my Phrygian video on YouTube, go to four and a half minutes because there's a thing. And you see Layla in the swing, but it's kind of, you can kind of see me through it, but she's in slow motion and it's in, all in blue. And she said, I look so lonely. I'm so lonely when she hears that music behind it, that Phrygian piece with her on the swing all alone. And I said, I said, you're not alone, baby. I was right there filming you. I was five feet away from you talking to you. But she almost got scared as if I had left her at the park by herself when she was seeing this. Because I think the the music uh, had this such a melancholy feel that it actually scared her. Uh, dissonance evokes a biological response. 
that something is wrong. Animals make noises and alarms to warn each other. Gino, that is actually extremely true. Tool references. Did somebody reference tool and saying that they use a lot of Phrygian? I wonder if I can change the emotion reaction to certain intervals, being in charge of our own emotions and imagination, just a thought. You know, I have certain, this is, this is really interesting because I have certain chords in D Dylan's last video that, um, thanks to you guys and 5 million other people has almost hit 5 million views on, on this channel here, which is really, really great. But somebody remarked on one of the chords that I played and I played, I played this chord. I played it in one of the, I think in my last Facebook live and I call this a, um, well, when I play it for Dylan, I say, Dylan, sing this chord from the top down. And it's like, eh, da, 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 da. And part of the mood of that, there's a couple things that are going on in that chord. You have this, you have this, you have this, and then you have this. But that is really the that and that. There are two distances. There's a minor nine interval and there's a minor second interval. When they're all played together, these ma major second intervals disperse the, the tension and soften the tension and make it melancholy. That's the way that I can describe it because if I just take the tension notes and I do this, it's very stark. It's beautiful still, but if I add these, if I if I add these, this part of the chord, just these notes, is a beautiful sound. Then if I add that there, that gives me a major seventh interval there. I'm sorry, there. And then I add that on the top, and I add this on the bottom, which gives me, or sorry. One of the uh, videos I did with Dylan, I used this chord, which is a D flat Lydian chord. And why I love that chord, I just think it's beautiful. If you go from E flat to, to D flat, so it's like E flat Mixolydian to D flat Lydian, but E flat Mixolydian, listen. Then too. It's just beautiful, beautiful, um, kind of cinematic kind of a chord that you would hear that evokes to me. It means something to me because of the, I mean, I, I try to analyze it, why I love the, that sound so much. Or I know one thing is this, big fat spread triad in the bottom of it. And then you have that Lydian tri triad right there. So you have the third and the fourth next to each other. And then this chordal structure on the top, which which give it, and you have this dissonance in there too. So you have a minor nine in there. So, so that whole chord has so many conflicted uh, notes in it. All these conflicted, if you want to call dissonances, conflicts. Um, it's, uh, you know, that it's what gives it its sound. It gives it that tension. So anyways, um, I think I will do a video on, on dissonance and emotion. That's actually a great, great idea. Really great idea. So that's kind of my deal on, on dissonances. There's one other thing. There's a, um, if you guys have any, have any things that you'd like me to do videos on for my YouTube channel, please Put it in the comments here, because that's a great dissonance versus emotion. Give me some good titles. Titles are good because that's I can I can I just vamp on my on my videos even here. I never prepare anything. You guys know that, right? This is all um I set up my computer. I didn't even join I didn't even I forgot to ask people to join on my uh on my pers on my everything music Facebook page. Um what is the psycho chord? 
Watch my video on uh, Bernard Herrmann, and I go through and I describe it note by note. Um, it's a cluster. I'm watching them, but I'm having trouble of grasping them. Glenn. You know, this is interesting. So people ask me what my purpose of my my YouTube channel is. It, it's it's um, it's Khan Academy for music. I'll eventually uh, have all different... I'm gonna, I'll eventually go back and have even third grade content on. I'm going to have to divide it up there. I don't mean third grade, but I mean I'll have beginning content as well. But it's really for professionals. It's a it's a music for it's it's videos for people that are pros, because I think that that's a, a really lacking. Um, most professionals don't know where to go uh, to pick up new ideas. They can listen to other people's music, other people's records, but. Most people don't have time to to keep studying. Um, you know, famous composers had composition teachers their whole lives, even if they were much more acclaimed than their teachers, things like that. Is there a harmony you can't name or that doesn't exist? Uh, probably. There, there's, there's nothing I can't name, but a harmony that doesn't exist? Maybe. Every... Thing that you hear is dependent on the atmosphere. I had an old friend of mine, I've talked about this one time, about having a guitar amplifier. This is my buddy Rick's idea. And you play guitar through, and it has one sound, but then you, you have a chamber that fills it up with different types of gas, presuming that like Krypton gas, for example, would have a different overtone series. And then you play and it's got a mic inside this this container that's filled with krypton gas and it has one overtone series then you fill it up with helium and it sounds completely different and then you fill it up with whatever other kind of gas any of the noble gases uh probably not radon that would probably be bad but you check it out and see probably not hydrogen that would be very flammable um but you see what the music sounds like so maybe music in different atmospheric conditions would have different overtone series. So maybe there are chords that we could never imagine. Uh, I am going to do a video too. One of the, I, I think, you know, I, I thought, well, I'll probably done with Dylan videos, you know, after the notation one, but I did have one other idea of a video to do with him. And it's, if I divide, I've never tried this before. If I divide the keyboard 24 keys and make it one octave. So they're all um, microtones in between there. So there'd be 24 notes per octave. So it'd be all the in-between notes. So if I played a note that was, you know, halfway between A and A flat, the Dylan will say A, A flat. So he'll, know, he'll name the microtones and see if he can get the actual named tones and know which microtones are in there if I played chords. That would be a monumental brain feat. It's interesting because I have people write to me all the time about this that have perfect pitch that say, I can't get those chords. I've got perfect pitch and I can only get a couple notes in the chord. How does Dylan do it? And I said, well, he's just been doing it for years and years. And I, when he was four and I realized he had perfect pitch, I'd be like, well, let's see, can you hear three note chords? Okay, that's easy. How about four note chords? Yeah. How about eight note chords? Yeah, you can hear those. Then you just start teaching them what they are. And, you know... At first, maybe he couldn't hear all eight notes, although I don't remember. I always remember him being able to hear eight notes or 10 notes or 12 notes. So um, I just kept, you know, seeing just out of curiosity. And Dylan doesn't doesn't particularly, he never practices it or anything, but, but um, it takes a tremendous amount of concentration to do these things that he's doing in these videos. There's harmonic analysis. There's, there's the actual being able to separate the chords. Uh, and then analyze them and see if there's any constant structures that he can hear um, and put names to. Then I ask him to sing and write the notes down, and then there's that. So then you have to use your memory, and you have to remember every note that's being writ, uh, played. Although, as you notice, I hold the sustain pedal down to aid him so that he can remind himself what tones have been played. You know, But sometimes I will do a thing where I'll play a chord like that, and he'll tell me all the notes just really fast like that. Um, thanks for all the sharing. Can you talk about my monitor system? Seems like you, cho you chose to go simple. No big name or big size monitors. Um, I have two sets of monitors here. Um, 
I've got some NS10s right there. Can you see that one? And they have these event PS6s. And I bought these PS6s in 1999. And I like the sound of them because that's all I could afford at a time. And they have really powerful power amps in them. And they're just pleasing to listen to. You just get used to anything. Most people use NS10s. They're not particularly nice speakers. And I do half the time on my NS10s. I have a subwoofer with them. Half the time on these. Whatever you get used to is what you get used to. I've also got some some little um, car radio things. I listen through my computer. I have this little um, brick thing here that I listen through a lot. It's a Sony thing that weighs a lot, and it's got a subwoofer in it. It's great to check local levels on and things like that for mixing. Um, so whatever your interest, you know, whatever you're used to is really any advice, Ted, for guitar players beginning to use keyboards as a tool for learning harmony or recommended instrument? Um, it's a great question. Um, I'm a guitar player. I learned piano um, to teach when I started, when I was a college professor, and I had a piano. Because growing up, I never had a piano in the house. I never had a piano lesson. So I would practice my... I practice scales. I practice... All types of scales. I practice arpeggios. I practice all different types of things on the on the keyboard because because it's not my it's not my normal instrument. So um, so I would you know start basic and learn basic major and minor chords. And then I would learn chords with an octave at the top. Um, and I would practice with octaves in the left hand. Then I practiced with fifths in the left hand. Then I would practice with full, if you can reach it, with full chords in the left hand, spread triads, things like that. So that's... Uh, it's all about practice. It's tough, you know, it's, it's, it's hard learning an instrument. I mean, I'm, I, you know... Let me tell you, I bought this like Roland key, this Roland keyboard. It's all I could afford. It's a Roland. People ask me about it. RD one hundred and fifty. I got to remember that. I bought it in in um, nineteen ninety nine or nine or two thousand to use to write on things like that, and to have a keyboard in my apartment that I was living in at the time. And um, I remember saying to myself, if I practice jazz piano every day in three years, I could be a great jazz pianist. And I practiced every day for about three days, and then I realized that because of my producing schedule, I didn't have the time. And uh, it always kind of bummed me out. So um, I know what jazz piano players pl playing should be. I know the voicings, I know all that stuff, uh, but it's something that you have to practice all the time to um, to be really great at. And my, I have to, you know, my right hand, I'm very good with my right hand, but my... Um, my left hand, um, you know, from not having piano lessons, that's something you just, you got to learn as a child. To, to play with counterpoint, things like that. Let me see here. Greetings from Brazil. Could I do a video about the difference between polyrhythm and polymeter? Oh, yes, absolutely. I haven't done any rhythm ones. Like, I haven't done any bass ones yet, and I wanted to do some bass ones on... Um, uh, I haven't done that much on music production lately. I don't know if, what you guys think about that. I did some of these videos. Um, it's hard to analyze. I did some mixers. Most mixers don't have strong enough styles that, that they're, they warrant having a video made about their style, about what they do. Because uh, a lot of it's done in the tracking, so that's really hard to talk about. But um, somebody asked me to do, my friend Mark asked me to do a a bass playing video and I'll do a video on walking bass lines and about playing rock bass maybe but I mean I've hardly done anything with guitar I want to do a guitar video where I talk about recording electric guitars which I do every day yet I've made no videos about them so um gladiator that's a that is a good soundtrack um how do I approach composition oh tell people how to get the Beato book yes the Beato book, wherever it is here. I thought I had it right here. The Beato book is a big, big seller. Hold on, I'm getting it right here to show you. For those of you that don't know about it, shameless self-promotion, 
I have literally sold hundreds of these now, the PDF version of them. It's 300 pages. And if you want something to use to follow along with my videos that you don't understand, this book has 10 times the information of my YouTube videos because it has notation in it and you can look at it at any time and you can follow along. So if I talk about, you know, uh, 12 tone triads, which I haven't even done a video of yet, you can follow along with it. If I talk about, you know, sub changes to giant steps, or if I talk about, you know, chord families and their scales, for example, see that there? You can just follow along and you don't have to write it down when I'm going nuts on my whiteboard that I have out there. So I have a series called What Every Pro Musician Should Know. It's a two-part series. You can get it. It's 47 bucks. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's worth twice that. Uh, and you can get it by sending $47 to my PayPal, which is rickbeato number one at gmail.com. That's my PayPal if you would like to purchase the Beato book. And I think everybody that is a YouTube subscriber should own my Beato book because I put my YouTube stuff on there for free for all of you. And not only is it something that helps me out, but it helps you out because it's something that you can benefit from um, and follow along. And it makes your learning of what I'm teaching way easier when you just go to the chapter that refers to the title that I'm talking about, okay? But the stuff I do in my videos are completely different. All the examples are totally different. It's, but to have the information, think of it as a textbook where it just has all the information right at your fingertips so you can learn at it and you can, you can, you can learn from it. And if you're a visual learner, it's really, um, I'm actually really a visual learner. That's so funny that I do music uh, for a living. You'd think I would be an auditory learner, but I'm actually not. Uh, psycho chord, vertigo. What's the psycho chord? Go watch my video. It's called Atonality in Clusters. That video, and then Bernard Herman. He's the guy that wrote the Psycho's soundtrack. I talk about that. What's my opinion of Berkeley College of Music? Um, I have friends that have worked there. I have plenty of friends that have gone there. And it's been an institution since the 70s. Um... Do I have an opinion of it as far as, you know, I don't know much about their, um, these days, about their curriculum, but um, I met a couple of the guys that run the film score, the, or the uh, recording department, and they gave me a tour of it, and they've got some great facilities there. I think a left hand would be better on piano from guitar and muscle memory. No, it's totally different. People think that about guitar and piano. On guitar, you're using your muscles this way. On the piano, you're using your muscles this way. It's completely different motion. When you turn your hand this way, it engages totally different muscles. Feels feels different anyways. Um, Glenn Gould is rough for you? Why is he rough? Oh, his style? Oh, because he sings, yeah. Mike Placement, guitar videos on rhythm, yeah. I will definitely do that. I mean, I've got, I've made 90 videos. I plan to make 5,000 videos and you think I'm kidding. I will make 5,000 videos in the next few years. Once I'm able to do this full time, if you guys will buy my Beato book and subscribe to my YouTube channel, I'll be able to do it full time and I can just make more and more and more and more videos. Uh, t Tony, that's a great one. Can I talk about film scoring going from full orchestra to sample libraries and DAWs? That is a great topic, actually. All right. That's it for today, everybody. I've got to uh, make a video here for YouTube. Whoever hasn't signed up to my YouTube channel, now go over and support me there and sign up. And buy the Beato book. 47 bucks. Best money ever spent. Anyways... Thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm Rick Beato. Have a great day. Take care.